the, the FOIA officer for the National Security Archive, which we'll be describing. And we're really uh, grateful to Nate to, um, for presenting this uh, introduction to, to using FOIA. Again, if you want to uh, let us know anything during the course of the webinar, um, then open up uh, the link for the visual part of the webinar that you received in the email. And um, at the top of that screen, uh, you'll see a green bar that uh, allows you to open a chat box if you don't already see one. And in that chat box, uh, just uh, write your question or if you're having any kind of technical problem. So uh, my name is John Lindsay Poland. I'm with the Fellowship of Reconciliation. This is the second Militarism Watch webinar. The first was on using official sources. And uh, we will be doing a series of these webinars in order to increase the ability to do uh, research on U.S. militarization and militarism for activists. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn, uh, turn this over to uh, Nate Jones. Again, thanks, Nate, for this presentation. And uh, we look forward to the conversation. Thanks, John. Am I on? All right. Um, let me just there. Can everybody hear me? All right. So my name is Nate Jones, and I'm the Freedom of Information Act coordinator at the National Security Archive. Um, and what that means uh, is that I oversee all of the thousands, tens of thousands of outgoing and ingoing Freedom of Information Act requests uh, and appeal that we do. Um, and today, uh, I'm going to talk briefly about the National Security Archive um, and briefly about uh, the history of FOIA and spend a big chunk talking about how to file effective Freedom of Information Act requests. Um, and Freedom of Information Act request, if you don't know, is abbreviated FOIA. So I might slip into that. Um, so first, I, I like to explain the National Security Archive. Um, we have an official sounding name, but we are a non-governmental organization. Uh, private, don't take any government funds. Uh, and we send requests to the government. Um, <laughs> I love uh, introducing our, myself by showing uh, what the Department of State, how they describe us. This is a WikiLeaks cable. Um, and this is uh, from uh, Montevideo, Uruguay, right here. Uh, and it's describing my colleague at the archive, Carlos Asario, uh, an IT manager at the National Security Archive an independent, non-governmental research institute and library at George Washington University. The media refers to Astorio as one of the most important declassifiers of the State Department's private documents. And I, I think they got that absolutely right, and that's the essence of us. Unfortunately, um, further down, uh, they describe us as dredging up the past, while, as I'll explain to you later, we um, like to think of ourselves as providing people information of what the government um, does in their name, if not always with their knowledge. So we still have to work on them a bit on that, but that's the archive. Um, I'll get to that quote later, uh, but this is another one of my colleagues, Kate Doyle, um, testifying uh, at the trial of former Peruvian leader uh, Fujimori. And um, basically she used, I believe, 21 documents that we um, got through FOIA um, from the Defense Intelligence Agency uh, to show and prove he was convicted um, that he had knowledge of his government actions and human rights abuses fighting uh, so-called terrorism. Um, so just one example uh, of a few I'll give you about um, the power of FOIA. Um, here, here's the National Security Archives rap sheet kind of quickly. Um, we were founded in 1985. Uh, by a bunch of people that just really liked FOIA uh, and wanted to have a mechanism to get documents to the public. Um, it, the archive really cut its teeth on Iran-Contra, and it's, as you guys probably know, it's our, the anniversary of the scandal just this month. Um, our goals are to broaden public debate, press for objective classification policies, uh, and 
preserve an accurate record of U.S. foreign policy um, that often you can't see through memoirs or history books or even uh, current press recounting, uh, only seeing, seeing the documents themselves. Um, we're independent, non-government, again, and we receive our funding from uh, various foundations uh, and our publications. Uh, we filed uh, thousands of FOIA requests uh, and lots of appeals. Um, we also uh, use litigation. Um, most recently, uh, we won a big case against the Central Intelligence Agency, um, getting them to release uh, their classified history of the Bay of Pigs. Uh, and we also publish a lot of stuff on our website, constantly updating. Uh, I'm also in charge of the blog, so check that out. Um, with, and we also have a huge um, comprehensive collection of our documents at research libraries, uh, lots of books too. The quote, piercing the self-serving veil of government secrecy, uh, was a quote we got when we got our George Polk um, Journalism Award, and I just think it rings, it has a great sound to it. Uh, and finally, um, we use our documents in legal cases and truth commissions, including Mexico, Gu Guatemala, Uruguay, Chile, Peru, Argentina, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Indonesia, Rwanda, Italy, and Spain. Um, and you can get uh, the rest of the information um, from our website, but that's a, a thumbnail sketch about us. And here are a couple of quick hits of the power of FOIA and um, how we can, some examples right off the top of my head of how FOIA can be used to fight militarism. Um, here's uh, the casket photos. Until our 2005 lawsuit, um, the public couldn't see the dignified return of remains of U.S. troops at um, Dover Air Force Base. Uh, this was actually a policy instituted um, during the first Gulf War uh, by then Secretary of Defense uh, Cheney. Um, and then, of course, in 2009, um, Secretary Gates lifted this ban on coverage. Here's another good one. This one actually is a corporation involved in militarism. Um, these are documents received from FOIA show that Chiquita Brands, the banana company, uh, paid right-wing Colombian militaries for protection. And as they described it, it was just the cost of doing business in Colombia. Um, if you see here, they, they show that they used a commercial corporation to, quote, um, disguise the real purpose of providing security. Um, so another example, and we have um, thousands of pages from this, but this is just one example. And finally, my third example. Um, great presentation last week uh, about uh, U.S. arms sales and how to just wrap your heads around this very difficult and murky topic. Uh, and just kind of by coincidence, I was working through another document that kind of showed um, what was really going on in the Department of State, actually, and how weapons are sold. And this is an interesting case. Um, in 1994, and earlier, I believe Lockheed Martin sold a bunch of F-16 fighter jets to Pakistan. And Pakistan paid for the jets. Um, but they weren't shipped. Um, then Pakistan t tested a nuclear weapon and Congress passed a law um, forbidding the shipment of these planes to Pakistan. But of course Lockheed Martin didn't want to reimburse Pakistan the money they'd already paid them uh, and others including the US Department of State wanted to find a new buyer. So they shopped around and finally determined that Indonesia might be the best bet to take these jets and then pay Pakistan, not the U.S., because it's quite a lot of money. Uh, and as many probably know, Indonesia had its own embargoes um, for the conflict in East Timor and its actions toward, toward the island. But the Department of State tried pretty hard to get around this, even going so far as asking the President, Clinton at the time, um, to essentially really pressure uh, Suharto to buy these planes. It didn't end up happening, but this is just one document um, gotten through FOIA uh, that shows kind of the inner workings that I don't think we would really know otherwise. Um, and this doc the complete document showing the whole story uh, is on our blog, so check it out if you're interested. Um, the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, this is essentially it boiled down. Uh, it was 
uh, passed in 1969, um, 67, excuse me. Each agency, upon any request for records, shall make the records promptly available to any person. Um, and I bet we have FOIA pros here that know it doesn't work quite this easily. Um, the promptly part especially, but we'll talk about that later. But boil down, this is the Freedom of Information Act, uh, a very powerful piece of legislation. Um, here are just a couple quickly. Uh, there's been a lot of news uh, about President Obama reinvigorating FOIA. He gave a day one directive, uh, speaking of the act's importance. Um, Attorney General Holder sent a memo to all executive departments and agencies, uh, speaking of the act's importance, saying that it should be, quote, realized in practice, presumption of openness. Uh, and I, I love this. In the face of doubt, openness prevails. And even Ron Ma Rahm Emanuel and Bob Bauer got into the act. Um, we, the National Security Archive does FOIA audits. And after the first one, the, Rahm, the day after, I don't think it was a, it, it was a coincidence, Rahm Emanuel sent this memo to every agency saying more work remains to be done on FOIA. Um, and just people always ask me, so how is FOIA under Obama? And what I think, my opinion, um, after conducting two FOIA audits and keeping my finger on the pulse and going to all the meetings here in D.C., is that there's been a clear directive from the top, from Obama and from the White House. Um, but there really is a disconnect at some of the some of the federal agencies. Uh, people have said, you know, changing the government's like turning around the ship of state. But what we've seen, especially with FOIA, uh, is that it's even more complicated than that. It's turning around a whole fleet of ships. Um, there are, I believe, 96 federal agencies and departments, and each one does FOIA their own way. And a lot of them, uh, I'll give props to the Department of State, have really taken Obama's and Holder's and uh, Rahm Emanuel's orders to heart and have changed their policies. Um, others have not. So despite the clear message from the top, we've seen really agency by agency and quite um, dis disparate uh, results from each agency is, is the answer. Um, even though the president says something, it's hard to get the agencies to comply, I guess is the takeaway. Um, so that's a bit about the National Security Archive, a, bit of, a little bit of background about the Freedom of Information Act. Um, and now I'm going to spend the rest of my time, the bulk, um, talking about how to file uh, good FOIA requests that are likely to get you your documents. Um, let's see here. And uh, of course, I'll, I'll answer any questions at the end. So, how to file a FOIA request, uh, and I just couldn't resist. This is one of my favorites. The most reproduced document at the National Archives is a photo of Nixon and Elvis, of course, and that was actually spurred by a Freedom of Information Act request. Uh, and this is my, my throwback to it. This is Nixon much later with, of course, RoboCop. I, I love that one. Um, now. I could speak for all day on how to do FOIA requests and appeals, um, and it's a pretty complicated subject. So in the, in the small amount of time I have here, um, I'm going to go over the basics. In the question session, we can get kind of in the nuts and bolts, but everything I say here is covered in detail in this guide we have on our website. Um, and basically everything you need to know about doing FOIA is in there. You could file good requests by reading this guide and not even listening to me. So you can, you can leave the webinar if you'd like. But what I would say is I'm going to just skim the surface in this talk and all the real details are in this free guide. Great guide. All right. Um, the first step is do your research. I even did it in all caps. Um, the most, the best thing you can do to have good luck getting the documents you want is do your do your primary research. Um, there's two kinds of requests generally. There's the shotgun spread request, all documents about the Iraq War, for example, and there's the specific request. Um, 
And these are the better ones. Whenever possible, make your request as specific as you can. Uh, here's some quick ways to go about doing this. Um, first, find what's already declassified. Lots of times, uh, people spend a lot of effort of their own and the agencies requesting documents that are already available to the public. Um, check the National Security Archives website. Um, check our digital database uh, that's available at almost all research universities. We give the archive a call, I'm serious, or an email. Um, check the agency's websites, uh, Department of State, Department of Defense, CIA, lots of others have lots of documents posted right there on their website, so you may not even have to file a request if you can just download it. Uh, and the the big one, I talk to students a lot, and they kind of look at me like I'm crazy, but you may have to do more than just web searches. Um, the best FOIA requesters I know do most of their preliminary research um, at the National Archive, which is the one for most federal records is here in Washington, D.C. Um, yeah, so some ways that you can make good targeted requests. Um, the best requests are the most narrow, and the most specific you can get is when you know exactly to the document level what you're looking for. Um, pretty much every day I read the newspaper, I see at least one, usually three, four, five things um, that can be used for a FOIA request. I have an example below. I'll get to it now. So this is from the Washington Times. The Justice Department wrote a secret memorandum authorizing the lethal, lethal targeting of Anwar al-Awlaki, al who is the American citizen in, in Yemen. Um, right there, there's a document, and that's FOIAable. Uh, and uh, and uh, I know you love to right, make FOIA turn it into what is FOIAable, a na uh, whatever. Um, so from newspaper articles, great source for finding documents to look for. Memoirs, very good. Uh, a lot of people that write their memoirs, two recent examples are their Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz memoirs, actually, uh, write their memoirs while they look at the documents that they had during their tenure. Uh, sometimes they look at classified documents and say everything in them, um, or some things in them, and don't mention that they're reading a classified document. But there are a lot of good hints in memoirs, sometimes specific, sometimes they'll say a memoir, or sometimes they'll allude, and you kind of have to read between the lines a little bit. Uh, but a great, uh, great source for narrowing and tailing your FOIA request and figuring out the documents you want. Um, congressional testimony. Uh, these are based on documents. So when someone from a federal agency goes to Congress, they do their research using documents that you probably can't see. But if you figure out what documents they used, you can request them. You've got to read between the lines a little bit, and sometimes they're cited, sometimes not. Another good source, uh, press briefings. I'm thinking right now specifically about DOD and Secretary er, and Department of State. Uh, they do briefings, I believe, every week. Uh, and these two are based off documents. Um, believe me, the press secretary or deputy, deputy press secretary is reading briefings, and the things they say are constructed from reports that the agencies wrote. So even if they don't cite it, you can kind of, again, read between the lines and see where that, where you think that information is coming from. Uh, pull slips from the National Archive. I, I said before that the National Archive is a great spot um, to start your request, and unfortunately it's in Washington, D.C. But if you're in the area and you go and look through the documents, the law states that whenever a classified document um, is n not releasable to the public. There has to be a little piece of paper in the box of documents that usually says the document's title and says you can't see it, researchers. And what that means is that it hasn't been screened yet, uh, but it means that you can request that it be screened. And a lot of the greatest documents I've seen, most interesting, most revealing, come, come from this. Um, as I alluded to before, Half the battle, maybe more about the battle, is figuring out where the document you're looking for is located. Um, and in closing, you got to think like a bureaucrat. Um, think like the people, or maybe I should say federal employee, I don't know if that's a, 
a bad word. Um, think how the people that are making these documents think. Um, if there's a meeting, there's going to be notes about a meeting. Um, if a, a high up person is going to make a decision, they're going to be briefed on that, and they're going to be briefed based on documents. Um, every time the Secretary of State goes to a country, she gets a briefing book uh, about the country and about the decisions they have to make, uh, and those are all foyable. There's that word again. <laughs> Which documents are foyable? Um, so, Congress wrote the Freedom of Information Act. Um, and it was smart enough not to include itself under FOIA. Uh, this, the courts are also not under FOIA, only the executive branch. Now, that's not to say that there's not a great wealth of information that you can get from the, uh, con from the legislative and judicial branches. And um, last week's talk hit that on the head, and I really recommend you check that out if you haven't. Um, but today, we're only talking about executive branch records. The good news is, is that the executive branch is pretty expan expansive. Uh, it covers the Department of State, the whole military, CIA, NSA, uh, Department of Transportation, lots of stuff. Um, presidential documents are also covered by FOIA and the Presidential Records Act, but these are not available until five years after the president leaves office. Um, and, and before I get too far along, uh, don't be dissuaded that the National Security Archive does mostly historic documents. Uh, current documents are absolutely uh, subject to FOIA as well. Um, every day I, I read the paper, I, I see at least one or two articles that say documents released in response to a Freedom of Information Act request. Uh, one example, um, a request to the Department of Homeland Security about its collaboration with the local police in regards to Occupy Wall Street, just one local example. So the FOIA process in a nutshell, um, here's how it works. Basically, you start by writing a simple letter and you send the request to an agency. Part of the trickiest part is figuring out which agency you send it to. There's 96. Um, the Excuse me. Uh, so things regarding treaties, you probably send them to the Department of State uh, or Department of Commerce. Uh, in the military, you have to figure out which branch you want to send it to. If you want to send it to the Secretary of Defense at the top uh, or to the Department of Navy, and that's tricky. Um, but generally, you have to think who would create this document to begin with. You've got to think like a bureaucrat, and then you'd send it. Here's what a FOIA request looks like. Pretty simple. Um, and I'm going to use that uh, example I used before about al Awaki. Pursuant to the Freedom of Information Act, I request a copy of the secret Department of Justice memorandum which authorized the lethal targeting of Anwar al Awaki. And I give a alternative spelling. Um, for your convenience, I've also attached a copy of the Washington Post article which references this memo. Um, and a point I want to make is that some, a mistake that some requesters think is that when they send a request, it kind of goes into a black hole. Um, but that's not the case. Um, the request goes to a person. And if your request is simple, concise, and easy to search for, and it includes a reference like this, uh, and I would just print out the post article and staple it to the request that you send a fax, um, it's probably more likely that the, the government employee on the other end is going to take your request more seriously and maybe get to it quicker than a request about uh, all documents ever produced on al al -Waki or something like that. Uh, going back to the FOIA process in a nutshell. So you'll send your request to the agency. The agency will acknowledge your request and send you a letter back saying, thanks for the request. Um, we have a long backlog, but here is your request number. And don't lose that number. What I do, what the archive does, is they keep a spreadsheet of all of their request numbers. That number that the agency gives you um, is basically the key to figuring out where your request is, where it has been, and where it's going. 
Sometimes the agency will ask you to clarify your request, but if you gave a good, uh, well-defined request to begin with, they probably won't. Then you would go back to the agency and say, here, I'll make my request more clear. And then the next step is either the agency will release the documents, and if they do, great. The system works, slap them up on the website, uh, and they might release them in full, like, that's great. Uh, and the case is closed, it's over. Or, especially with documents uh, relating to militarism, perhaps, um, they release the documents in part or not at all. And if they do that, you have the right to appeal. Now, quickly, um, some FOIA exemptions. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these. I could spend a day doing it. Um, and they're in the guide at the start. Um, the one that we see a lot is national security information, um, and that's about national defense or foreign policy. Uh, that's exemption one. Another one you should know is exemption three, which is kind of the catch-all exemption, and there's actually 240 congressional statutes, uh, ranging from information about melons, I kid you not, to informate to photos of the second the second round of photos uh, of um, Abu Ghraib abuses. So Congress passed a law that said that these documents are now exempt under B3 of FOIA, and President Obama signed it. And so that is kind of the B, an example of the B3 catch-all exemption. Um, other ones that we see a lot are internal rules and practices, and interagency or intra-agency communication. And these ones are tricky because they cover a lot of stuff. Um, so an agency, if they wanted to, could use a lot of things and exempt them under these two. Um, Pre uh, Attorney General Holder uh, instructed agencies to use their discretion and use these two exemptions less. Some agencies are, some aren't. Uh, even in my opinion, the Department of Justice has been using uh, B5 much too much, um, but you'll see those exemptions a lot. And finally, uh, law enforcement information, just a quick overview of the exemptions. So uh, back to the FOIA process in a nutshell. Um, so the requester may appeal, and I'll talk about some appeal arguments briefly in, in a minute. Um, and the, the appeal goes back to the agency, and the agency will either respond positively uh, more, but not always all, documents are released, uh, or they'll say, nope, no dice, we don't like your appeal, no documents can be released. Finally, at this point, um, the requester uh, can sue. Okay, we can, uh, I'll go over questions later, but that's the FOIA process in a nutshell. Now, after I, you're finally starting to get your head around FOIA, I want to bring up uh, one more thing, and I, I am wrapping up, but this is a very important tool um, and definitely something that you guys should know about. Everyone talks about FOIA. All the newspapers talk about FOIA. In the press, in the radio, on Twitter, everyone talks about FOIA. But there actually, in my opinion, is a more effective way to get documents if you can know the title of the document, and that's called MDR. Um, excuse my acronyms, Mandatory Declassification Review. Um, FOIA was a law written by Congress. MDR is a mechanism that was written by executive order by the president and not passed by Congress. Um, and MDR states that one, if the document is classified, not all documents are, and two, if you can say the title or very close to the title of the document, um, then you can use this mechanism, MDR, to request the document. Um, and the reason that that might be better is because MDR is the same process as FOIA, more or less. You, one, request the document. You get some or none of the document. You appeal within the agency. But MDR has one extra step. If the appeal at the agency, you don't like it, you can go to this board at NARA and appeal one more time. Uh, and this board, I'll show you a graphic later, is much more favorable, um, and to be candid, much more, they release more documents um, than the agencies themselves. And there's really something to say about having a document reviewed 
by an independent, highly qualified um, group of people that don't have quote unquote equity in the document rather than an agency reviewing its own document. So I would recommend uh, going to ICECAP, uh, it's, excuse me, uh, using MDR and eventually going to this NARA board called the acronym is ICECAP in their agency security classification panel, I believe, uh, whenever possible. So let's go through this spreadsheet really quick. Uh, using the Department of Justice memo uh, about being able to kill LL Walker, the justification. Is your request for a single document or a very narrow series of documents? Yep, it's one memo. So consider filing an MDR. Okay. Two, uh, is the request security classified? Yep, in the Washington Post it said it was secret. And, and classified means it's stamped confidential, secret, or top secret. There are others too, but those are the big ones. And if it is, yep, consider filing an MDR. Um, are you likely to litigate? And in my case, no, I don't think I'm going to litigate on this one. Uh, filing FOIA lawsuits is really expensive. That's kind of the trade-off. With FOIA, you can go to a judge. With MDR, your last chance is this NARA appeals panel. Uh, and no, I'm not going to litigate, so I should consider filing an MDR. And I did indeed file an MDR, um, mandatory declassification review. Uh, and just really briefly, uh, this is the same thing as a FOIA request. Uh, very simple language. It says, pursuant to Executive Order 13526, I request a copy of this memo. I've attached a copy for your convenience uh, and let the system work. Now, I think John is giving me the, the red light. So I'm just about done. Uh, quickly, uh, here is a graph of the percentage uh, of MDR requests that are released. We don't really have good FOIA stats, but as you can see, MDR, 63% are declassified in their entirety, Tw an additional 29 declassified in part. So that's almost 90%. And my last takeaway is appeal, appeal, appeal. Uh, always appeal your FOIA decisions. As you can see, if that's 9% sliver, 18% um, got more information released entirely, and 43 got more information released in part. Um, and when you appeal, uh, it means that another, perhaps wiser, perhaps more uh, experienced FOIA reviewer reviews the request again. Um, let's, I think we probably should go to questions and after that uh, time permitting, I'll talk about some arguments for making good appeals. Um, but the, all of this stuff of course is in the FOIA guide. I'm going to turn it over to John here. That's okay, Nate. Uh, um, thank you so much. That, that's really great. Um, and we want to invite everybody to submit your questions in the chat box uh, on the webinar uh, on, on your uh, meeting center uh, screen. So I want to start it off, Nate. Uh, you can hear me okay, right? Yep. Uh, it, with a question about appeals, mm -hmm. um, because you said appeal, appeal, appeal. So what kind of um, legal or other kinds of research do you think is important for making FOIA appeals? I mean, usually do you just say, uh, you said no, but actually we really want it? Or do you think generally it's important to add some kind of argument to, uh, to in your appeal? And does that also depend on what kind of request it is? Um, absolutely, good question. The short answer is saying, oh, we just really want it, doesn't usually work. Um, let me pull up my slide on appeals, if um, we can make that happen. Um, do you guys see that? Yep. All right. So basically, there are three brief 
arguments used for appeals, and um, just I'll just skim the surface. Um, one great thing you can do is show that sim similar information or the same information has already been released, and uh, should be an ED right there. Um, look on the National Security Archives website. Look on the site's FOIA website and show that their secrecy in this regard just doesn't make sense because other agencies uh, have already set precedent of allowing the public this information. Um, show that the release of information is in the public interest, especially on some of the exemptions. The law states that agencies must weigh the public interest against the agency's desire to keep this information unavailable. Um, so show why this, for example, the memo about al Waki say that in a democracy, uh, we, I'm arguing that it's in the public interest to know the, for the public to know uh, who, and, who and cannot be targeted for assassination, to use a simple example. And finally, this is a very good one um, and one that always works. The Freedom of Information Act, um, and to a lesser extent, MDR, says that, uh, to the same extent, MDR, excuse me, says that you must release all segregable information. So when you see the blacked out lines and stuff, that means that when you, some information on the page can be released, um, but others must be protected for national security reasons. Um, and often agencies, the FOIA people, um, will say, see a document's classified and be say, oh, no, can't have it, it's classified. That's a mistake, that's contrary to the law. And if you point out in your appeal to maybe an agency lawyer who knows the law, that the law states they must review every document uh, line by line um, and show that uh, even if some must be not released, uh, some is releasable. Uh, finally, I just want to point out that common sense wins the day. Uh, and these people, again, that are reading your appeal, they're real people. Uh, and if you make a common sense argument and they see that documents have already been released, see that uh, it's in the public interest, uh, it's very likely that they'll uh, release the document. Uh, the National Security Archive, our bread and butter, is writing good appeals, and more than 50% we win our appeals. Mm -hmm. That's great, Nate. Uh, we have a question from one of the participants about uh, how email, uh, how, uh, how um, FOIA requests are submitted. So do they need to be mailed by certified mail or anything special, and can you do an email request? Good question. It's agency by agency. Um, more and more, uh, agencies are accepting email, and when they do, I usually use email to sit, submit my request, uh, the National Security Archives request. Um, myself, I usually do a PDF and just attach it. Um, the best way to know the answer to your question is, and this is a great question, this is something I forgot to say, is by law, every agency, each of the 96, um, is required to have a FOIA page on their website and that has all of the information and every page required by law is supposed to, must have a line that says where to submit your FOIA request. And if they say this email, sure, send them an email. Um, if they say we have our own uh, web online website, use that if you like. Uh, they all have a mailing address and most of them have faxes. Um, Often, I use a fax, even though no one uses faxes anymore for FOIA. We still do because it's quicker, and you get a receipt that shows that you send it. If you do mail, you have to, I think, pay. But if you fax, uh, you have that fax sheet that shows the number and shows that it went through. Um, and again, I'll reiterate, that's one part of the battle is requesting your request. Uh, but the other is getting that letter back, having the agency acknowledge it, uh, and giving you that number. Because without, heaven forbid, if you do a request and wait 10 years, but whatever, it got lost in the interwebs or whatever, and the agency never gave you their number, you're probably out of luck. So I'd reiterate, if you haven't got that number back after maybe two weeks, 
I would call up the agency and just confirm that they that they had the request. And usually agencies are very good about um, sending um, their acknowledgement with that number within a few days. Mm -hmm. So that that kind of information you can find on their website, right? Their their email address and phone number and fax number, typically, right? Uh, excuse me. That that information of uh, of of their phone number to call them up or their fax number or their email is is usually on their website. Is that correct? Yep. The law states that every agency must have a phone number on the website that you can call, and I almost always have great luck calling with them. Um, it's called the, the when in doubt, call the FOIA liaison and. And every agency has their own FOIA liaison, and they're almost always very helpful. Um, which kind of leads me to another point I just want to reiterate is uh, if something's not going right, pick up the phone. Uh, with every agency, there's people on the other end. Uh, and I always have a lot of luck um, just saying, hey, I understand you have a lot of constraints, many FOIA professionals, that's just part of, in addition to their other job, and, and understand that, but say, this is what I really want, these, this document, um, what can I do to make it easier for you, or to narrow the request, or to guess where I think within the bureaucracy this document might be located. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, don't hesitate to talk to the people at the other end, I've had a lot of good interactions with them and had a lot of luck. Um, what you shouldn't do, a FOIA don't, is think that these people are machines. Um, FOIA is a very human process. It's actually kind of cool um, to be able to search through all these records. A machine couldn't do it. It's not like Google. Um, you have to have people that comb through paper records uh, and have an intimate knowledge of their agencies to be able to find this stuff. Um, so don't hesitate to pick up the phone. Right. Uh, so I have, so another question. I have another question here, Nate, um, which has to do with petitions to the Department of Defense. So you know, the Department of Defense is such a massive, massive bureaucracy, and uh, you know, you have the Office of the Secretary of Defense at the top. But if you're uh, making a request about something within that bureaucracy, how do you decide whether to submit the request kind of at the top? or say to the army, or mm -hmm. to an individual command, or an agency, or a military base uh, within that bureaucracy? How do you, or, or actually whether, you, whether to submit it to multiple levels or parts of the bureaucracy? Yes, gotcha. Good question. Um, most agencies have one spot to submit a FOIA request. There's a couple that are different and the Department of Defense is one of them. Um, and each component of the DOD, and that includes the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, Central Command, Southern Command, those are all different components, have their own FOIA office, and you have to submit your request um, to that specific office. So my answer to the question, very good question, especially for mili militarism, um, is I would target specifically the command, uh, the places you think the documents exist. So for example, where are these documents on file? And for some requests, not all, uh, it's a good idea to send them to multiple components of the DOD. Um, and as I list components, I don't want to forget Office of the Secretary of Defense um, at the very top. So if the secretary's eyes see it at the top, uh, you want to send it there. If the Joint Chiefs of Staff's eyes see it, you probably want to send it there. If you don't think it ever gets up that high, but it gets to someone in one of the commands, you want to send it there. If the Secretary of the Navy's eyes see it, you probably want to send it there. And there are definitely circumstances when you would send requests to more than one component of an agency. A good example, we just recently, we were trying to get the last minutes, the minutes of Gorbachev and Reagan's last meeting. Um, the Reagan Library was missing them. They had everything around it, but not the minutes. Uh, the Department of State, we sent a request to the Office of the Secretary of Department of State, 
and they too had everything around it, but not the minutes. But finally, uh, we did an appeal actually, and then they searched the office of the Bureau of European Affairs. Uh, and lo and behold, that section, for whatever reason, I don't know, had a copy. So a good example of uh, sometimes you have to submit requests to more than one component. Mm -hmm. So drilling down a little bit more on that, if, if you were researching uh, a U.S. military base, which could be within the United States or it could be outside the United States, uh, would would you just submit it to that base as well as uh, any kind of command that it you know it belongs to, or uh, you know sometimes bases also they have tenant organizations on them, but if you're trying to figure out about the activities on a certain base. How would you figure out whose eyes see the records about that base? Mm -hmm. uh, I would go to the Department of Defense's website, and they're required by law to list all of their FOIA officers, offices, excuse me, and just go down the list and see what you think. And the short answer to that question, without knowing the specifics, is I would file a request to the base. That would be probably your best hope. Also, the command that probably would be a little bit less. Uh, and I would file, file excuse me, um, file to Office of the Secretary of Defense, and that would even be a little bit less. But I would do those three, probably. Um, another good option um, is the, well, especially for information about collaboration with foreign military, is the Department, uh, excuse me, the Defense Intelligence Agency is, is also an option. Um, but I would start with those and then go through the list of FOIA offices at the DOD and see if anything else is good uh, or looks good or looks like they may have touched or seen or have a copy of the documents you think you're looking for. You're looking for. Uh -huh. Great. So there's another pair of questions that have come in from a participant about fees. Mm -hmm. And um, so one of the, the first of these is I've heard that they charge per page. Uh, is that right? And if so, how can the fee be waived? And the second part of this question is, do you run the risk of them releasing thousands of pages to you and charging you lots of money? Good question. Um, every, all the nuts and bolts about this, again, are in the guide. Uh, but the short answer, well, the answer uh, is that, yes, you have to pay, everyone has to pay for Everyone has to pay for um, copying fees. Journalists, educational institutions, and others, and this is complicated and a bit of a gray area and suggestive and subjective, if the agency decides, don't have to pay for search and review. There was also a very important lawsuit uh, that just ended that said, um, and said that if an agency goes over 20 business days in a, in, a, in a response, then you don't have to pay search and review, but you still have to pay copying fees. Usually five cents a page is the first part, uh, but that varies a little bit. The second part of the answer is part two of three. Part two is that, again, it goes agency by agency, but usually uh, you should, when you, when the agency sends you your first letter, um, they will say, how much money are you willing to pay? And if you say up to $20 or $100, that's usually all they need. Uh, and even if you don't have to, often you don't have to pay that much. And often agencies waive the fee. Um, it's a weird part of the law. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I can speak more about it later. Um, but I also want to mention that you have the right so you want to say, sorry, you want to say to the person working your case, say, I don't want 10,000 pages. I only want 100 pages about this. And that'll make your lives easier for both of you. So try and do that. Finally, if you do want a lot of pages, you have the right uh, to say, I want this information on a CD-ROM, not this. This, uh, this is great. So uh, I got this uh, the other day. Wouldn't it be easier, you guys see that? Wouldn't it be easier to get this instead of that? So you have the right to request that they put your request on a CD. Some agencies don't comply. 
I don't know why not. We need to keep pushing them to, but you can at least try and request that. Um, I think uh, that's the short answer. Fees are a contentious and complicated uh, topic. Um, I will add that if you want in your letter, you can say, I'm willing to pay up to $10 in fees or up to $100 in fees. Uh, usually the National Security Archive, in our original letter, we have a second paragraph saying we're willing to pay up to $100. Um, sometimes we get charged for copying, uh, but often the agencies, because it's agency by agency, uh, is not worth their time to calculate it. So they give you the document for free, documents mm -hmm. for free. Well, that's um, great to know about CD-ROMs, Nate, because uh, that also can make the documents that you receive more searchable. Yep. Because you're able to, to look at them on the computer. Um, I have another question, which uh, has to do with the National Archives. Because mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that that's a key place for doing uh, preliminary research uh, and also getting leads for, for documents. And um, my, my question about National Archives is, uh, are they primarily documents that are of a certain age? Or do uh, recent or current documents also get filed at the National Archives? So if I'm looking for something that is going on right now or a document that's being created right now or this year, am I likely to find them even a you know a classified uh, slip about about it at the National Archives? Yeah, good question. The answer is unfortunately probably not. Um, the archives, the rule of thumb is for documents 25 years or older go to the National Archives. The good news is if you are looking for a historical archive, documents, if it's at the National Archive, your chances of getting the documents a lot easier because there's that scaffolding, that framework, that piece of paper that says you can't see the document but we know where it is. If the document's not at the National Archive, you don't even have that and your job is trickier. Um, so the archive, the National Archive is, most, is almost exclusively for historic documents. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Unless there's another question, something I wanted to add. Um, one more not question. all agencies' FOIA are created equally. Um, but the good news I want to share with you guys um, is there are some agencies that are quicker than others and um, do a, a better job finding documents. And it has to do with their search system computerized. Um, it's computerized so they have a faster turnaround time. The first place I would go whenever possible is Department of State. They have a very good FOIA office. Often I get documents from them within a matter of months, especially for simpler requests. Um, the Office of the Secretary of Defense is also pretty good. Um, the Department, excuse me, the Defense Intelligence Agency, Intelligence Agency um, is also good, not as good as those two. Um, and the Air Force is also pretty good. For, and those are just off the top of my head. Um, I, those would be my first request, if possible, if they have the documents, try them, uh, especially the Department of State. Um, uh, any other questions? Well, I guess I would just add uh, that use the National Security Archive uh, as a resource. Um, check out our documents, check out our website, our blog, follow us on Twitter, uh, and don't hesitate to shoot us an email, shoot me an email about any FOIA questions. Uh, we love chatting about documents um, and anything we can do to help you get the documents out of the government hand, government's hands and into yours, uh, we're happy to do. I don't know if John is still on, but I'll, I'll hang around until he gives us the closing uh, or else uh, ask any more questions if you got them. Uh, there's one, well, I got no, Ivan. Uh, there's one more, which is, um, uh, is there a way to find out if you have a national security letter issued against you? Uh, the, the questioner says there's reason to believe that after 911 
and uh, this is also in the press, that law enforcement has abused the issuance of these letters against uh, innocent citizens. Uh, is that something that, uh, that's foyable, and if so, how? I don't think so. Um, I think if you, the short answer is no. If you filed a FOIA request for that, probably uh, whoever issued this letter uh, would say that they can neither confirm nor deny that this letter exists. Uh, so even if a, even if an innocent two-year-old wrote that and there, in fact, was not a national security letter, uh, you would get a response perhaps frustratingly saying, uh, we can neither confirm nor deny. Uh -huh. So unfortunately, no, probably not. Your best chance of getting, your best chance of getting information about that would probably be uh, scourging um, judicial branch documents, but even that would be tricky. Mm -hmm. Or you might be able to get your FBI file if you have one, right? Yes, but that probably wouldn't have a national security letter. But yes, uh, a comment uh, anyone that wants can request some aspects, not all of their FBI file through a FOIA request, which could be a little interesting, maybe nerve wracking. Mm -hmm. So uh, to conclude, Nate, I just want to ask one last question, which is um, uh, what kind of advice you would give uh, in general to people who uh, want to use FOIA as a, as a research method, and particularly people who um, are not like doing this as a professional, like, you know, you, you're able to devote full time to it. A lot of people, there's some people who are on this webinar who are full time activists and other people who are doing it as volunteers. So what kind of advice would you give in general to people about using FOIA and um, the kinds of qualities that you know really need to be employed in making it successful? Um, yeah, great question to close with. Uh, one, I'd reiterate, um, when you make your requests, make them as specific and intelligent as possible, and that'll help you well on your way. Uh, but more broadly speaking, um, people around here joke that doing FOIA requests is like planting acorns. Um, and sometimes you have to wait a long time. And it can be frustrating, uh, especially if it, you're an activist or you're using your free time. And sometimes you do have to wait years for a request. Um, but I would say more often than not, even when you get those documents after a long fight, after your maybe appeal, your MDR appeal, and then your appeal to NARA. And finally, uh, when those documents are released, I think that a classified, the release of a document that was once classified is in itself revealing um, and newsworthy and can have an impact. So I would say don't get discouraged um, by the long waits. Uh, and while you're doing that, I just like planting real acorns. Um, the more requests you file, not intelligent, not unintelligent requests, intelligent targeted requests, the more of those you file, um, the more luck you'll have of <laughs> having that beautiful tree sprout, sprout or getting a good document. Um, and the more that you request, the easier it becomes. You saw, you saw the letters. They're simple. Um, and you can reap very good rewards and a lot of knowledge from a pretty simple letter. Great. Well, thank you so much, Nate, for um, sharing your expertise and guiding us through this. We will be posting uh, Nate's PowerPoint on the Militarism Watch uh, website, and uh, we'll send out a follow-up email to all those people who registered for this webinar. Um, in addition, um, others can stream the webinar uh, from our website. There'll be a link on there, and we'll send that out to, to registrants as well. So thanks so much to all of you for, um, for uh, participating and attending, and thanks to Nate for, for the great presentation. My pleasure. Keep up the good work. Adelante.
Nice job.